Uh, so it's also my job to introduce our next keynote speaker, uh, who knows something about uh, being hassled by border guards. Uh, his name is Peter Watts. He is a science fiction author, a scientist, and uh, kind of an example of the type of voice we're trying to bring to the IAPP and our conferences. Someone with some great ideas, someone who sees as his crowning achievement the fact that he once wrote a novel that was deemed too dark for the Russian audience, and they would not uh, <laughs> translate it. If you are too dark for the Russians, you win in my book. You have done something very, very right. So please join me in welcoming Peter Watts. How's the volume? Good. Yeah, the Russians actually ended up um, publishing the book after all when it started making money. Um, anyway, when, uh, when I first fielded Sam's invitation to talk to you today, uh, my immediate reaction was that this is some kind of a, a cruel hoax. Um, and I, I gotta say, having spoken to some of you in the interim, I'm, I'm still not entirely convinced that it isn't. Um, <laughs> I am, as has been pointed out, a mid-list science fiction writer. Um, I used to be a marine biologist. What in God's name do I have to say that would be of any interest to anybody with, with uh, an interest in privacy issues? And yet, I am not the first science fiction author to make an appearance at one of these things. I'm not even the first SF author with scientific credentials. Uh, David Brin gave a talk uh, a couple of months ago at your DC summit, apparently, on, the on his idea of the transparent society. Um, I've heard him talk on the subject myself. I'm reasonably familiar with his talking points. Uh, Brin argues that trying to legislate an end to government surveillance will never work because we primates come with dominance hierarchies built into standard equipment telling our leaders that they cannot spy on us is the equivalent, this is his analogy, of poking a silverback gorilla with a stick. They just won't stand for it. But perhaps they might let us look back. So we'll watch the watchers, the camera will point both ways, the playing field will be level. Now the dude is a physicist, so I suppose he can be forgiven for thinking that it would be anywhere close to a good idea to get into a staring contest with a large, aggressive territorial mammal that is primed to think of direct eye contact as a threat display. Um, to name a, uh, speaking as a, as a biologist, I myself cannot recommend it. To name a couple of obvious examples, uh, Chelsea Manning looked back and they threw away the key. Ed Snowden looked back, he got a, a target on his chest. More than one silverback gorilla has opined publicly that they would like to see that man assassinated. On a more uh, modest and local level, we're all pretty much familiar with the litany of abuses that various law enforcement officers heap upon the citizens they're charged with protecting. We also know how they generally react to being recorded by civilians, or even worse, to the suggestion that uh, we look back by putting cameras in their cars. Over in uh, Los Angeles, they already went that route, only to find that vital bits of the surveillance equipment that was involved in the process went mysteriously missing in the field. Um, apparently, for reasons that nobody really expected, cops don't like being spied upon. So as ex-CIA man Barry Eisler puts it, we are living in a society where the government knows more and more about the citizenry, and the citizenry is permitted to know less and less about the government. Um, in this light, my own words come back to haunt me from my altercation with U.S. border authorities back in 2009. The last thing I said to them before they start started throwing punches was, I just want to know what's going on. And yet, if you look past the superficial dumbness of the gorilla example, there is a fundamental truth under there. We are mammals. We were cobbled into existence by the same processes of natural selection that shaped every other form of life on this planet. We do have certain hardwired responses that were forged in our evolutionary past, and anybody who thinks that their own behavior isn't at least partly informed by those legacy circuits has not been paying attention. So I'm going to talk about a couple of those circuits today. 
I'm going to start by suggesting that your whole organization may have been misnamed. Perhaps the hot button issue is not so much privacy as it is surveillance. Now, you might ask if that's even a difference that makes a difference. I think it is. A perfect example broke just yesterday. Turns out the feds are collecting our Facebook and Twitter data. No particular reason. There's no specific investigation going on. They, they just like to keep an eye on us. You know, just nothing to see here. Now, privacy obviously is not the issue here. Nobody on a, face, on, a, on a social network has any reasonable expectation of privacy, but you still assume that you're just one voice in a chorus, and there is something kind of visceral in the realization that, in fact, what you are instead is a target. I think that reaction isn't so much philosophical as it is instinctive. And I'm going to try and convince you of this by asking you to find God. God is actually pretty easy to find. We think God got started in pareidolia, which is that cognitive glitch that allows you to see faces in the clouds, uh, Elvis in a burrito, that kind of thing. And we think that pareidolia arose as an anti-predator strategy. As it happens, I've just finished um, writing a novel that explores the functional utility of the religious impulse, so I'm going to steal an info dump from that book to help make my point. Look, Brooks wanted to say, 50,000 years ago, there were these three guys spread out across the plain, and they each heard something rustling in the grass. The first one thought it was a tiger, and he ran like hell. And it was a tiger, but the guy got away. The second one thought it was a tiger, and he ran like hell. But it was only the wind, and his friends all laughed at him for being such a chicken shit. But the third guy, he thought it was only the wind, so he shrugged it off, and a tiger had him for dinner. And the same thing happened a million times across 10,000 generations. And after a while, everyone was seeing tigers in the grass, even when there weren't any tigers, because even chicken shits have more kids than corpses do. And from those humble beginnings, we learned to see faces in the clouds and portents in the stars, to see agency and randomness, because natural selection favors the paranoid. Even now, we are wired to believe that unseen things are watching us. And it came to pass that certain people figured out how to use that. They painted their faces, or they wore funny hats. They shook their rattles and waved their crosses, and they said, yes, there are tigers in the grass, there are faces in the sky, and they will be very angry if you do not obey their commandments. You must make offerings to appease them. You must bring grain and gold and altar boys for our delectation, or they will strike you down and send you to the awful place. And people believed them by the billions, because after all, they could see the invisible tigers. So, cut to the present. For a very long time now, people that don't see agency everywhere have a disproportionate tendency to get eaten. That's not so much a problem now. But the program persists. We still see patterns in everything. Butterflies and Rorschach blots, faces in clouds. We hear ghosts and monsters in the creaking of stairs at night. And we can make a testable prediction here. Because if all of this does result from an ancient threat response, you would expect that false positive pattern matching would intensify during periods of social unrest, when people are feeling especially scared or insecure. Well, according to work out of the University of Texas, this is exactly what happens. People who feel helpless are more likely to see patterns in pictures of random visual static. They're more likely to see conspiracies and connections in unrelated events. Belief in God and astrology also goes up during periods of social unrest. Religion tends to prosper in lands where people have reason to be afraid. It's far more prevalent in developing nations than in developed ones. And the one exception that you might want to cite for that, the good old US of A, actually kind of proves the point, because in a very real way, the US is not a developed country. Uh, 17 first world nations in this database, um, Australasian, European, and North American. I've highlighted the US in yellow for easy access. Social metric along the Y axis, um, religiosity of the society along the X. The further to the left you are, the more fundamentalist you are. And as you can see, um, by any, pretty much any social metric you would care to name, I'm basically just showing you what am I showing you? Um, I'm showing you infant mortality and homicide rate, but exactly the same pattern holds for STDs, divorce, life expectancy, a whole bunch of variables that I don't have time to show you. You'll find that the US is generally the worst of the lot. And it is also, by a significant margin, the most religious. 
Religion is also adaptive at the group level, not just the individual one. Religious communes tend to persist longer than secular communes, significantly, other things being equal. And within those religious communes, the ones that last longest still are those that preach kind of a, a vicious, patriarchal, peeping Tom God, the kind of angry, vengeful Old Testament God that it catches you masturbating and casts you into hell for the wickedness in your thought. Those communes seem to last longer than other faith-based communities with, that believe in a kind of a loving and a more generous deity. A myriad studies basically support the idea that authoritarian religions based on fear of surveillance have a competitive edge in Darwin's universe. Just putting a picture of eyes, and I'm not even talking about a photorealistic picture of eyes, I'm talking about a lame-ass Gary Larson-level pencil sketch of eyes. Sticking that on the wall will reduce cheating exams or cheating behavior during tests. So will inserting the word ghost into casual conversation. Something that abstract is enough to scare us, albeit subconsciously, into changing our behavior. So when we talk about privacy, we are probably not talking about some cultural artifact that arose wholesale out of the Victorian era. That's the first take-home point here. The link between surveillance and fear is a lot deeper and a lot older than your average post-privacy advocate is willing to admit. Now, the usual suspects have done a bang-up job of amping up the whole fear side of the equation over the past few years. Uh, but of course, because of the correlation, what they've also done is amp up our sensitivity to potential surveillance. And despite the official narrative, when we look around, we do not see a lot of brown-skinned Tewoists doing the tiger's share of the surveilling. What we do see is the invocation of terrorism to cover up the fact that an innocent person's life was ruined for eight years because of a typo on the no-fly list. We see a woman denied entry to the States because somehow U.S. border authorities have access to her confidential medical records. I experienced something like that similar myself back in 1991 when I lived in Guelph. I was caught at two in the morning uh, turning right on a red light on a bicycle. I was pulled over and I asked some impertinent questions about my civil rights that got me hauled in for the night. Uh, it, it was a fairly trivial infraction. I was never convicted. Uh, if you go looking for a record of that on the archives, Canadian archives, you will not find it. However, two decades later, U.S. authorities cited that event to try and have me declared a repeat offender. And that gives you some idea of the granularity of the data that our masters were sharing a solid decade before 9-11 made it fashionable. Turning from the personal to the corporate, uh, not that corporations aren't also people, of course, we see things like the Trans-Pacific Partnership being negotiated entirely in secret. We see consumer appliances spying on our behavior and reporting back to home office, even after we have found the hidden, undocumented menu that's supposed to tell them to stop. We see an ongoing series of government attempts to legislate online surveillance of Canadians without any of that messy warrant and disclosure stuff. What we see basically here <coughs> excuse me, is stalking behavior. And I mean this in the biological, not the sexual harassment sense. Corporate entities do it for profits, uh, political entities do it to secure power, but in both cases, what we see is stealth and concealment. Now, we would hear things rustling in the grass behind us, even if there wasn't anything there, because that just happens to be the way we're wired. But it gets worse when somebody invokes hackers or terrorists or creepy guys in trench coats to justify poking around in our private lives. Uh, you may remember when Victoz basically played that chord, tried to describe everybody who was opposed to C30 as pro-pedophile. A lot of critics claim that um, sur blanket surveillance amounts to treating us all like criminals, but I think it goes deeper than that. I think what we really feel like is prey. Now, the good news is there's obviously increasing awareness that you can damp down a lot of these alarm responses if you just stop sneaking, on, sneaking around on us. Uh, put your tracking policies front and center. Make transparent the perfectly reasonable exchange of personal data for services. Um, you're going to engender a lot less paranoia than if you secretly change everybody's privacy defaults and then hide the controls to, to change them back under five levels of undocumented submenus. Even Facebook has managed to figure that out by now. 
The bad news is, even if you want to be fair and open, you're frequently not allowed to be. You have a lot of valuable data, after all, and government and law enforcement don't really believe that we're all criminals, but they damn well know that some of us are. So why not collect all the data right now so that whoever the bad guys turn out to be down the road, you'll have the relevant data in hand. It is much easier to go fishing with a drift net than a long line, if you'll forgive a marine biology reference. Who cares if you end up tearing up the whole damn seabed in the process? So even companies who care about protecting privacy still basically have to give it up when the spooks come calling. And as we all know, most companies don't really care about privacy. Just last week, for example, we discovered that Canadian telecoms aren't just scraping our data for their own profit, they're serving it up as an all-you-can-eat buffet for any hungry spooks who happen to wander by, all served for a very reasonable service fee to cover the mutual back-scratching expenses. Still, let us fantasize for a little bit, and let us assume that somewhere out there, there really is a country that really does try to protect client privacy. How do you do that when at any moment you could be conscripted as a law enforcement cat's paw? This is not the kind of a slogan that's really calculated to engender a whole lot of confidence, but it's really actually pretty the only honest slogan. So here's a wild thought. Don't just offer data protection, especially since you can't guarantee it. Offer data destruction instead. I'm not talking about Bryn World, where everybody knows everything and the lions lie down with the lambs. I'm talking about a more Darwinian place, where when the lions come calling, you burn down your chunk of the veld before they get their hands on it. So forget the transparent society. What I guess I'm advocating is the scorched earth society. I do not expect many of you to embrace this. I'm told that I'm told that a lot of lawyers show up at these things, and I'm guessing the standard legal toolbox does not come equipped with a standard middle finger to stick to authorities. Then again, lawyers also know that the law is an ass. They know that some are more equal than others. That. Cats get to write the laws for mice. That Bush and Cheney will never be indicted for war crimes. In this particular case, our goal here is to blind Big Brother. Does anybody really expect that the law will ever smile on that goal, when the guys who write the laws are the same ones who want to spy on us? I think Bryn's dead right on that score, at least. So let's admit that any effective privacy strategy is almost by definition bound to be on shaky legal ground, and proceed from there. The government shows up and demands all your metadata. You hit a kill switch; everything evaporates. There's nothing left for them to pillage. Pretty stupid, right? It's like some schoolyard revenge fantasy, you know, giving a middle finger to the man. You'd probably find more emotional maturity in a Harry Potter novel. It had never happened because when the feds show up, you either cave or you pay the price. Okay, well maybe Lababit didn't cave. Um, but that had to hold do with the, uh, the Ed Snowden thing, so that was probably an anomalous event. Okay, maybe Cryptoseal didn't cave either,、um, but twice is still just a coincidence. Three times, maybe we're looking at a trend. Now it's painfully obvious to all of you by now that I don't know anything about the law. What I do know about is biology. I have some sense of where we came from as a species. I know that ethics and morality are not human traits; they are mammalian ones. Capuchins feel empathy. Chimps have a sense of fair play. Any number of social mammals have what you might want to call a justice instinct—a drive to punish cheaters and freeloaders in the community. Our own species is hardwired for revenge, to the point where we will punish those who trespass against us, even if meeting out that punishment hurts us. More than it hurts our transgressors, we will cut off our nose, despite our faces. How that runs the gamut from relatively trivial、uh, financial games in which people feel、um, cheated out of small amounts of money, all the way up to suicide bombers, who, as it turns out, are apparently not the wild-eyed, ignorant religious zealots we always thought.、Uh, most of the studies of these fellows show that they tend to be well-educated 
well-employed, reasonably sane, in some cases even secular. One motivation they do have in common, though, is low self-esteem, a sense of humiliation. They regard their own lives as so cheapened that those lives will gain value if they trade them in against a higher value target. It's a net benefit situation, you might say. It's, it's revenge economics. But this is not so much economics as it is simple brainstem biology. And that's why I think that a scorched earth approach, irrational though it might seem, might actually take off. It appeals to those of us who feel powerless and screwed over. It, it, it appeals to those of us who really want to take back some measure of control over our lives, even if it costs us. I personally don't use cloud-based services. I think anyone who trusts their data to the cloud is an idiot. But I would sign up for a scorched earth service purely as a sign of political support. I mean, I'm a, I'm a science fiction writer by trade, right? Wild speculation is, is essentially what I do. But even I have some standards. You may not find the idea of a self-destructing commercial data bank to be particularly plausible. I myself think that it's at least as likely as a world of rainbows and unicorns in which the gorillas set down their fiber taps and their security certificates and let us gaze deeply into their eyes. And since most of you have already eaten, that's the image I'm going to leave you with. Thank you.